Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a great webinar lined up. Uh, we're going to discuss the USMLE Step 3 and uh, go through some tips, as well as do a, a couple of practice cases with you tonight. Um, we're thrilled to have you join us. My name is Mike Stevens. I am a PGY3 dermatology resident. Uh, I have been with MST for uh, three and a half, close to four years now, hard to believe. I um, tutor for step one, step two, step three, and everything in between. Uh, I'm thrilled to be joined tonight by Dr. Callie Morris, and I'll turn it over to you, Callie, for introductions. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Callie. I'm a second year um, pediatrics resident. Um, I have been with MST since May, so um, not as long as um, Mike, but I um, also tutor for step one, step two, and step three. Um, I've done the most for step three and really enjoy that. Um, so yeah, excited to be here. Awesome. All right. So let's, uh, we'll dive in and just uh, out of the get-go, take a little bit of a step back and give you guys a, a framework for who we are here at MST. Um, uh, we're a group of medical students, residents, fellows, attendings, people who have gone through the process of medical education and kind of have an idea of the ins and outs related to board exams, shelf exams, residency applications and interviews, the match, even board exams, and, um, and a long track record of student success and, and working with students to achieve success that comes with all of those things. Uh, we've gone through the process, kind of have an idea of, of how to navigate all of it and, and want to pay that forward to help you uh, reach that level of success. Um, and so, uh, so tonight, of course, we'll be talking about step three. And so just to give you guys a, a little bit of an idea, um, we're going to first talk about just a general overview of the test itself, what it is, what to expect on, on your preparation and on exam day. Um, as well as give you uh, some tips for how to structure your studying and preparation, scheduling, how you study, and the exam itself. Of course, step three is a unique test when it comes to the board exams insofar as, you know, you're used to the multiple choice style of things. Uh, there's a little bit of a curveball here in the CCS cases. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and, and what to expect. Um, as well as run through a couple of sample, sample cases so you guys get an idea of, of how to navigate that. Um, the very end, one of my favorite parts of these webinars is we'll do a Q&A session. Uh, it's an opportunity for uh, you all to um, ask any questions that might be things that we didn't address during the session itself. Um, you can feel free to drop those questions in at any point. Um, we'll do our best to answer many of them in real time, but um, other things we might have to save till the end and can run, run through with you. Uh, also, just to put a plug, I know as... Uh, Throughout your training, you're inundated with tons and tons of surveys. And the end of our webinar tonight, we promise it takes 20 seconds and is super helpful for us to get an idea of ways that, you know, things that are, are, are good and, and helpful from these webinars, ways that we can improve. And so we really love it if, if you guys have the opportunity just to take a, a few seconds to give us any feedback you think that uh, might be helpful for us. Um, and so uh, diving in now into the, the content of what we're going to talk about. Just to, just to state it, you know, I think there might have been historically a perception of step three. There's an old adage, it's like um, uh, two months for step one, two weeks for step two, and a number two pencil for step three to imply, you know, don't prepare, it's nothing, don't worry about it, just walk in and take it. And, and you know, the reality is that maybe there was a point in time where that was the case, but I don't think that's the reality anymore. And, and step three, you know, is number one, one of those exams, like any of them, you, you don't certainly don't want to fail this test. Uh, it's time consuming and your time is valuable. It's an exam that you were, you know, putting a lot of investment into both with, you know, paying for the exam and, and the preparation and time that you put into preparing for it. Uh, and so, so number one, make sure you're, you're comfortably within passing range. And, you know, I think that the, the dynamics are shifting if you're looking into a fellowship, you know, if there are other aspects of, you know, your, your training after residency, it's important to always demonstrate that you're willing to put your best, best foot forward and not shirking a responsibility or taking the easy way out. And so this exam is, is certainly not one to, to just completely ignore and, and skate through. I think, and a lot of these things we're going to highlight over the course of the evening, but just to just to stress these up front, um, avoid resource fatigue. You know, it, it can be hard to know what's important to use and what's not important to use. And we're going to talk about kind of a general framework of, of which resources to use, but don't get overwhelmed. 
you're busy, you know, you, 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 you may be in residency or have other commitments. And so it's not realistic to think that you can read three textbooks and do multiple Q banks in a one or two month span of time that you might have carved out to prepare. Don't underestimate the CCS cases. They're different. They're a little unique. It's a kind of, it's almost like working with a new EMR. And you have to get used to that. You have to get used to the framework that they're going to be testing you in. As always, practice questions are your best friend in any of these things. Make sure you try to do as many as possible. And then this is going to be a recurring theme throughout the night. Biostats, biostats, biostats. Uh, the first day of the exam is intensely biostats heavy. I, I would say, you know, a third, maybe even more than that, half of the test um, is biostats. And it's, it's really crucial uh, that, that you feel comfortable with that. Um, Kelly, anything that you might add or any other suggestions or thoughts, maybe as it relates to biostats or other things? Yeah, I was going to say, I think really the, the only thing I'll add is, is how crucial the biostat section is. I've had um, many students I've worked with um, that I've tutored that, um, you know, if they struggled on the exam, you know, if they had to take the exam like a second time, it was almost exclusively because they underestimated biostats. And so I think that is um, a huge piece of, um, you know, making sure you take the time um, to study that because it, it does, um, I think it, it is not clear when you're doing UWorld and things like that, how um, important it is, but it really is so important. Yeah, absolutely. Couldn't say, honestly, couldn't say it better myself. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, kind of how to establish your timeline of when to take step three um, and kind of how to create um, a study schedule, if you will. Um, you know, the, the thing that um, we've already kind of alluded to and that obviously um, most of you know, the thing that's different about step three is um, a lot of people are taking it during residency. Um, you know, obviously if you had some time off between med school and residency, um, you might have a little bit different of a timeline, but um, for the most part, most people take this um, in the middle of residency, um, which is always um, a little bit challenging to make your study schedule. It's a lot different than, um, than the time you had, you know, probably to study for step one or even step two um, during medical school. Um, so when it comes to creating your timeline, um, there's a couple um, guidelines that we think are really important. One is don't leave your test date open-ended. Um, I have seen this um, with myself and my friends um, that have all taken this exam. You know, if you just leave it as an arbitrary, like, oh, I'm going to take it maybe in February, um, you will keep moving it and moving it and moving it. And um, you will inevitably like be mad at yourself because you took so much time um, to just do it. Um, so pick a date. Um, I usually try to tell people, um, you know, it depend obviously depends on your residency program and what your life is looking like, but try to find a rotation that you're on that is a little bit better hours, you know, maybe leading up to the month before this. Um, so you maybe have a little bit more time to study, um, but pick a date and stick to it. Um, that's really the, the best piece of advice that I can give. Um, and kind of going along with that, you definitely have to be realistic about the time you have to study. So if you're doing 28 hour call a um, month, that's probably not a great um, month to try to fit in studying because on your days off, you're probably exhausted and sleeping. Um, so, you know, be realistic about it, but also um, try to utilize the time that you do have. You know, um, I really recommend people, you know, like you know, if you have some downtime at work, like that's a great time to do 10 questions, you know, and that adds up over time. And so you kind of have to sometimes build some time into your work day to get your studying done. Um, but it really is doable if you kind of think ahead and plan ahead and just really, you know, utilize the time that you do have um, as, as wisely as you can. Um, the other big thing that I would recommend, and it's not always possible, um, but the, something about step three, which I truly did not even know until I went to go register for the test, is it is a two-day test. Um, so the first day, um, like we kind of talked about, is um, all like QBank questions and a lot of the biostats. Um, and then the second day, you have more, you know, just multiple choice questions um, at the beginning of the day. And then you have the CCS cases at the end of the day. Um, and when you're scheduling your exam, you can, there's numerous options depending on the testing center. Sometimes you can get an exam day like back to back. So you could take it Thursday, Friday. Um, but you have, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I think you have up to two weeks to take. I between. believe so. I think it has to be, you can't spend it more than that. But yeah, yes, it can't be more than two weeks, but you can take up to two weeks. And so I wouldn't really probably recommend doing the two week thing because then that's just too much time. 
but like a few days in between the first and the second day, I would highly recommend it. One, because then you're not burnt out after, um, you know, taking a nine hour exam, you know, um, nobody wants to wake up and go there the first thing the next day. I personally did it, but I, it was not enjoyable. Um, and the other reason that um, if you can, if your schedule allows it, it would be great to kind of give you that space um, is that then you have a couple days to solely focus on the CCS cases in between um, both your first day and your second day, um, since you're not going to see any of those cases on the first day of your testing. Um, and so it gives you a couple extra days to, you know, kind of review some really important kind of um, topics or like commonly, you know, the commonly used orders that you type in, um, much like we said already, it's like using a new EMR. So just having a couple extra days to practice that um, with biostats, like out of your mind, you can push that out and only focus on the cases. And um, that's really helpful. Um, and then last but not least, um, making sure you have time to do practice tests, um, I think is really one of the most important things. Um, I think a lot of people, um, it, you know, it's hard to carve out, you know, like for example, like the U world practice tests are, you know, a solid four hours. And then you have to like review all of the questions as well after you get done. So it's, it's a whole day. And so it's probably using possibly your only day off one week, you know, to, to do it. But I, um, strongly recommend it because a, it just gives you um, a good idea of if you are far enough away from that passing mark to feel comfortable. Um, and it also just, the more questions you see, the better. So even if you somehow, you know, get through all the UWorld questions, QBank twice, right? Those are the, the practice tests. That's an extra, you know, couple hundred questions that you get right there um, that contain, you know, topics that you might not have seen in the normal QBank. So, um, definitely build time to do at least one, if not two, um, into your study schedule. Um, and you'll definitely feel the most, um, prepared, um, on exam day, if you have time to do that. Awesome. And so dovetailing off of that, then, uh, just to give you guys a, an idea of what a, a sample study schedule might look like. And of course, just to state it and, and emphasize that this isn't one size fits all, of course. And you might have to carve out time depending on what your schedule is like. And if you are in residency and, and on a more difficult block, maybe then you might have to be a little bit more flexible. But as mentioned before, questions are going to be crucial in this. And, uh, and so as it currently stands, the, the, U -World, the U World Question Bank is, is expanding. I think it's somewhere between 1,600 and 1,700 questions now. Um, and so what you'd be looking at is, is if you're, this is again, just a, a sample of a, of a five week study schedule. Uh, the um, general breakdown is maybe aiming to have most of the QBank done in the, in, the, in the month, in the four weeks leading up to your exam, and then rounding it out in the final week. Um, and, and, you know, you don't have to immediately dive into the CCS cases. Um, this is something that you can kind of slowly start to ramp up into as you get closer to your exam. It's best to try to get through all of the cases if you can. Um, but they go quickly, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a, in a second. But I often will have um, um, peers and students that I'm working with start the cases kind of into their study period, maybe halfway or so, and, and slowly escalate as their exam day approaches. Um, and then, of course, like any kind of board exam in that final week, as you're getting really close to the test, you know, really go through the high yield content, especially biostats. Really can't, I mean, <laughs> I know it might, it might sound like a broken record by the end of the night, but especially the, the week five, really, really focus on trying to, to um, blast through as much of the biostats as you can to make sure you, you've got all of that solid. Um, all right. And so we'll shift gears to CCS cases. And, and Callie, I'll let you take it away again. Yeah, so with um, CCS cases, um, there's it's it's truly just so much different than any other type of you know USMLE exam um, portion that you've ever done. Even those of us that did um, CS, which I know people no longer are doing, um, so you know similar to that, but but still very different. And so I think um, kind of having a good just general approach um, to these cases is really helpful. Um, so like we said, there's um, different ways that you can practice these um, cases. So UWorld has both what they call like practice cases and interactive cases. Um, and so um, as we mentioned, like 
usually starting about halfway through your study period, um, doing the interactive cases is great. I have some students that study kind of over a longer period, you know, more like a two month period where they'll do those UWorld practice cases, which you don't physically type in orders or anything you, like that. You just really read through the case. Um, and so sometimes people will start doing like one of those a day earlier on. Um, and that can be helpful just to kind of get a general feel for like what these cases are even about. Um, so I've had many students use either both UWorld and the CCS cases from ccscases.com just to kind of get familiar with how to type in the orders because that's truly like the most complicated part of this is knowing if you want to order X, Y, or Z, how to make that happen in the software. Um, the other kind of general approach type tip that um, we usually tell people is um, definitely, you know, a lot of times these cases are very clear cut. So they're going to give you, uh, you know, like a one liner about the patient right off the bat um, when the case starts. And most of the time, maybe I would say, I don't know, 75% of the time, you might know from that alone what the diagnosis is because they give you the classic symptoms, uh, you know, signs and symptoms of that. Um, but even when they do that, um, you know, in, in real life, in theory, if you could just like do only the tests for that, that would be great. Um, but for the purpose of this test, they want to kind of see that you have thought about the big picture of the patient, you've thought about the other possibilities, and you've ordered kind of the pertinent testing and, um, you know, treatments for those things. So maintaining a broad differential um, is helpful, is even when you know for sure what the diagnosis is, but especially when, you know, you're going to have a couple cases, usually one to two, they're a little bit trickier. Um, and they might, you might have to order kind of a plethora of um, diagnostic tests to be able to figure out what is going on. Um, so really just, you know, you have a moment on the exam to like take a step back and think like, what's going on here? Like, what are my big categories of, you know, like buckets of what these diagnoses can be? And that'll really help you decide what orders to put in. Um, the other big thing that I think is crucial to this exam, um, that, or this portion of the exam, um, that I think um, is something that a lot of people don't talk about is really kind of being able to very quickly develop how, like, how sick, like an idea of how sick the patient is and what you need to do right off the bat. Um, so in these cases, sometimes you'll have a patient that is presenting, you know, they'll present to the ER and they'll tell you, you know, that the patient's in the ER. Um, and in real life, if somebody's coming into the trauma bay after a motor vehicle accident, you know, the nurses are going to be, you know, hooking up monitors, you know, getting a line started, um, giving the patient oxygen, you know, they're going to be doing some of these things before you maybe even walked in the room. Um, but for the purpose of this exam, um, you have to pretend like you and only you are responsible for all of the care for this patient. Um, and so being able to quickly, you know, by the little, you know, blurb they give you about the HPI and maybe their vital signs, you have to very quickly decide, is this patient really sick or not? Um, if they're really sick, you have to very quickly, you know, order all the things I just mentioned. So monitors, oxygen, start an IV, you know, all of the things that honestly are amazing, you know, nursing colleagues are usually doing for us. Um, if they're not that sick, you have a little bit of time to decide, you know, oh, I'll do my physical first before I order some of these things. Um, so that's a really good skill to develop while you're practicing these um, cases is, you know, um, is this patient really sick? And did I do the right things quickly enough for those really sick patients? Um, the other big thing which people forget, um, and you know, honestly, maybe wouldn't know if they didn't do, you know, if you just went in blind um, to do this exam, um, is that for any patient that's needing a surgery, so if somebody needs a colon cholecystectomy, you know, they have, you know, cholecystitis, um, you need to make sure you make them NPO and do all of the things in the hospital that you would do pre-op. So, you know, get your coags, get a type and screen, you know, make sure they're on IV fluids, that they're going to be NPO for a long time. If they're, you know, a woman of childbearing age, make sure you have a negative pregnancy test, like all of those types of things that are very easy to forget, but they're like, I always kind of call those like you're probably not going to fail the exam if you forget some of those things, but they're like free bonus points. And they show that you really took the time to think about what you would do in real life for this patient. Um, so I always recommend, you know, just think, think about what you would do in real life if you were putting in these orders for your patient. 
And last but not least, um, another thing that's really easy to forget, um, but it's also, again, kind of your bonus points, if you will, um, is counseling patients. And so um, at the end of these cases, um, both on the interactive cases on UWorld and in real life, at the end of the case, it'll pop up um, with like a box that says like you have two minutes to um, enter extra orders. And so that is a great time where if you didn't have time earlier um, during the case to counsel your patients on everything under the sun. So you will see that like, you know, they counsel patients about seatbelt safety and, you know, for sure if they drink alcohol or smoke or, um, you know, need counseling on contraception, things like that. Those are great times to put in all of those orders. Um, I usually saved it until that last two minutes, just because that was my like scheduled time to put all of those in um, and make sure I got, you know, my little check mark for um, talking about those things. Um, so that's a great thing to kind of get in the habit of when you're practicing these cases is throwing in, like, I literally had an order of like how I would type them. So I wouldn't forget anything. So um, definitely get used to that when you're practicing these cases. That's awesome. I honestly can't, uh, restated enough I, with that kind of framework to approaching it. And, um, and just to put one more plug for the ccscases.com, we have no, no stake in this, but, um, but do want to say that I think that together with the U world, these, these are the best ways to prepare for it. And especially the ccscases.com, the beauty of it is the feedback that it gives you. It tells you what, you know, what you did right and what you did wrong and how to get better in the future on these things. Um, so, um, so that uh, a great resource to kind of put all of this into action. Oh, and so do uh, dovetails right into the the next screen here that um, kind of goes into a, this a little bit more. I think they've expanded it now, um, and so it's actually now 140 cases. Um, you have the full interface at your disposal. So with it, with the um, both the UWorld and the CCSCases.com, it just gets you comfortable with frankly, the EMR that you're working in. And so in just like in any hospital, you're putting in orders, you're putting in um, uh, communications, consult requests, all of this kind of stuff, same things happening in, in this kind of mock EMR. And, and you just need to get comfortable with being able to do that. Um, and again, just to emphasize that, that scoring and feedback that's given to you at the end of each case. Uh, you're able to try this out. Um, before you you dive into it, so you can do two free cases before you um, before you purchase, uh, and it's it's a just a monthly. They they do have actually multiple packages now, but um, you can try it out for one month at a, at a at a pretty reasonable expense and see how you like the um, the other cases that they also have. And so, uh, and so with that, we'll we'll kind of switch gears, and and um, I'll let Callie take it from here, going through our first uh, sample case. So this is very um, reminiscent of what will be on your actual um, exam or any of the practice cases on ccscases.com or UWorld. Um, it usually starts with an in HPI similar to this. So I'll kind of read this and we'll um, kind of work through this case and think about what types of things we would order. Um, so this is a 23 year old female who's presenting with right lower quadrant pain that started three hours ago. The pain initially began at her umbilicus um, but later migrated to her right lower quadrant. It is also associated with nausea, vomiting, and chills. She has no significant um, past medical history aside from endorsing smoking a half pack per day. Um, so kind of my approach to this is that, you know, you probably have read this and like I alluded to earlier, um, a lot of the cases are this straightforward. So um, I'm sure most of you in your head right now kind of already have an idea of what they're getting at and what this diagnosis probably is. Um, but like I said, the key is learning how to efficiently use the software to put in your orders and getting all of those little points along the way, um, to show that you thought about every aspect of this patient's care. Um, so kind of going forward, um, with this knowledge, what kind of things would we think about ordering? What kind of, you know, interventions might, might we do off the bat? And feel free, everybody, to, to chime yeah, in. Jump in the, in the um, chat, yeah. Well. Yeah, I'm seeing lots of great things in the chat. So people are saying, um, 
get some labs, get do our physical exams. So some of the labs that I'm seeing are CBC, CMP, urine, pregnancy test, um, make them NPO, um, and then do our physical exam. I'm seeing some other um, like imaging, so abdominal ultrasound, perfect. Honestly, I'm like, that nails it. So you guys got it. Like, and again, like this sounds so silly and like, it's really easy when you're like in the moment and you're like, oh, I have time to think about it. Um, a lot of people get anxiety around surrounding these cases, but it really is this simple. Just take a moment to think like what's going on with this patient and what things do I need to do right away? So I think um, there's, there's numerous ways you could approach this. Um, and on the real exam, um, they would also probably give you her vitals. So assuming she is not hypotensive, not like super tachycardic and like, you know, not in an emergent state, you definitely could approach this one of two ways. You could do your physical exam first and then get labs, or you could order some basic labs and then do your physical because um, again, in real life, you're probably going to be doing a lot of these things simultaneously. Um, so in terms of the physical exam, um, something that, um, again, I was not aware of until I started studying these CCS cases is you can't just say like, I want a physical exam. Um, you have to pick what um, physical exam items that you want. Um, and as we have listed here, the, the big four that like pretty much exclusively on every patient, you should order these unless there's some weird um, extenuating circumstances would be general appearance, which they sometimes will include very important like pieces of information in that general appearance. Um, so um, I think that's an important one to like make sure you click even if you don't think it's that important. Um, and then obviously heart, lungs, abdomen um, in any patient, particularly in this patient, like abdomen is gonna be very important. Um, and then some of your other options of things that you can order. So you can do um, genital exam, you can do HENT, you can do skin. Your other options are like um, lymph nodes, um, MSK, neuro. But in this case, um, you definitely probably, you definitely want the big four. And then I usually say, you know, um, if they're not critically ill, you should get these other things in general. You know, it's really easy, like quick to do a skin exam, to do HENT. Um, the one that I, I get a lot of questions about is um, like genital and rectal exams. Um, my general approach is what I say is if, um, you know, if it seems like it could be potentially be a GU related issue, like you're never going to get points off for doing it. So in this case, in a woman that's having like abdominal pain that could be like pelvic in nature, I think it's totally fair to get it. Um, and then of course, you guys said a lot of the things that we talked about already. Um, uh, or the labs that we're going to get. So CBC, CMP. Um, some people already were kind of alluding to the fact that this patient should probably be NPO, probably because you're thinking this might be a surgical issue. Um, and so anytime you're thinking it could be a surgical issue, just go ahead and get your coags as well. It's really quick and easy. I, I would probably add like a type and screen on here as well. Um, and then in this patient, you know, they didn't tell us um, the, the vitals for this case, but um, assuming that she probably was febrile and, you know, you can get really sick with what we think this diagnosis is, um, grabbing a blood culture is not a bad idea, but again, that's probably not something that you're going to fail if you don't do. Um, and then, um, a lot of people were talking about getting a pregnancy test, which is perfect, um, both for the fact that, you know, she might be going to surgery and also for the fact that if you're having any sort of like pelvic, you know, right lower quadrant pain could be, um, ectopic pregnancy. So you definitely want to get that. And then getting a UA is always like a reasonable thing too, with any sort of kind of, um, you know, pelvic or abdominal pain, um, in a woman. And then we, like everyone said, getting an abdominal, um, and pelvic ultrasound would be great. Um, again, you could, um, on the exam, um, if I remember correctly, abdominal and pelvic ultrasounds are separate. You would have to order them separately. So you could approach this one of two ways. You could order them both at the same time, or if you are very suspicious that it's probably not pelvic and it's more abdominal, you could get the abdominal ultrasound first um, and then order the pelvic ultrasound after that. So um, as long as the patient is stable, if they're not stable, you should just get them both right away. Awesome. And I, I think, um, I think one point you brought up that's great is the, the more of these cases you do, the more you just kind of develop a knee jerk reaction for certain scenarios. And so like getting a pregnancy test is hugely important it may not get you points in every single scenario, but there are going to be situations that knowing whether a patient is pregnant or not pregnant will be very crucial to the overall trajectory of the case. 
and uh, and just having that as like a knee jerk reaction. Like if if a patient could potentially get pregnant, being able to figure out if they are in fact pregnant is going to be very important. Other things like. Um, you know, if they have any kind of chest pain or something that might be an atypical version of chest pain, thinking immediately about an EKG. Uh, if they have, um, if they're smoking, then you want to make sure you counsel on smoking. We'll, we'll talk more about these kinds of things, but just the more you do these, the more you kind of have these reflex reactions um, to, to kind of this initial order panel. And then we already talked about a lot of these things and you all like were way on top of this with being like, she needs to be NPO, like the second she walks into the ER and you're like, great. Um, but the other things that are very easily like forgotten, um, but are again, like easy points to get um, is making sure you consult the appropriate specialists in whatever the case is. So in this case, um, I'm sure you all are feeling fairly confident at this point that this was likely appendicitis, which it probably was. Um, and so um, making sure you consult surgery. Um, and so you have the option of consulting any service that you want. Um, very, you know, very specialized things. I will say a lot of the times they will say, Thank you for this consult, like consider or continue medical management. Um, and so it doesn't always, they're not always going to like immediately give you an answer or like take over the care of the patient, um, but it still is important to consult them. So consulting surgery. And then in this case, um, you know, we did a great job thinking about like, okay, she needs to be NPO, um, but we probably should start doing a lot of the other things that she's going to need. So anyone that's coming in with like extreme right lower quadrant pain is probably going to need IV pain medication and probably going to need fluids and or antibiotics. So um, making sure you get an IV ordered right away and you literally order like place IV. Um, so getting that right off the bat, um, giving pain medications for patients that are in pain. I know that sounds so silly, but it's really easy to forget. I mean, even just like giving or giving somebody with a fever Tylenol, like it sounds so silly, but it, those are good points to get that are um, commonly missed. So pain medication, antibiotics, and then um, a lot of people already said in the chat, like ordering those um, standard kind of perioperative labs right away. So that was great. Um, and then the big thing that you'll have to decide, you know, sometimes, you know, depending on um, the length of the case and really what the um, USMLE wants you to prove that you know how to do from the case, you know, it might stop as soon as you, um, you know, order the abdominal ultrasound and it shows appendicitis, or it might make you um, transfer the patient from the emergency department to the inpatient unit. Or if it was a patient that's severely ill, you might have to transfer them to the ICU. Um, so making sure you put in, you know, the orders or, you know, click the buttons to say like this patient needs to be admitted um, is important to do. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the case, or, you know, whenever you have, you know, some free time in the case, making sure you talk to the patient about anything that is pertinent to their health um, that you can counsel them on. So um, smoking cessation would be a, a great thing to counsel them on. And you could, like I said, throw that in in your last little two minute box, or if you have time during the case, um, counsel them on that earlier. Awesome. Great job, guys, on that last case. I, I think that was um, you guys did a phenomenal job, kind of running through it. And, and Callie, thanks so much for um, a really streamlined and an excellent approach to it. Um, I, I often, what I often recommend is as you're going through and you notice as you're reading the little things that you might want to counsel on at some point, just take a note of that and, and save it for that two minute point. After which, you know, you, you can't really advance the case anymore, but you can still place the final orders. Uh, and that would be a great opportunity to, to kind of make sure you clean all of that up. But just as long as you have a running list, you'll be able to remember everything. Um, and so we'll, we'll run through it one more time. We'll do another uh, sample case with you all and, um, and kind of let you see the EMR itself. Of course, it's hard to make it fully interactive over this webinar format, but you can see the interface and how you, how you kind of go about navigating it. And, um, and so we'll, we'll dive into the second case here. Um, and so we have a, a patient in the emergency department. He's a, a 65 year old man, and he's been having sharp chest pain and respiratory distress. He's in acute distress moaning and holding his hands over the right side of his chest. And so immediately your, your, your gear should start turning about, you know, differential diagnoses for chest pain and respiratory distress. You know, this is, it, keep it pretty broad right now. You don't really have too much information to help you narrow down to maybe one specific thing, but of course, as you go, the goal is to get there. Uh, um, and so what we'll do is we'll, we'll switch to the next screen that shows um, some of his vitals. So you can see that he is afebrile, but he is tachycardic, he is tachypnic, and he is hypotensive. Uh, his 
Um, vitals are only otherwise notable for uh, an elevated BMI, but, but otherwise pretty unremarkable. Um, and so I, I think we can take a second here. If anyone wants to throw out any diagnoses that they're thinking about or, or things that they're concerned about here, right up off the bat. And, and remember with these questions, um, the, the diagnosis is often, you know, I don't mean to say it like it's always readily apparent. You, you'll have questions that are a little bit of a diagnostic mystery and you have to kind of figure it out from the orders that you place and the workup that you do. But oftentimes they, they drive it home pretty well. Great. I love, you guys are so on it. So we have a lot of, a lot of people thinking about uh, great things for, for respiratory distress and chest pain. We have PE, we have uh, a, um, aortic dissection, we have uh, acute coronary syndrome, um, pneumothorax, Perfect. All right. So we're going to get a little bit more of the history here. Um, and so the uh, patient is an accountant. He um, was brought in after he developed excruciating sharp pain in the right side of his chest and that respiratory distress that we, we discussed. It's eight out of 10. It increases with respiration. So that's, that's a term that we would term pleuritic chest pain, uh, chest pain that gets worse with the deep breath. Um, unable to answer questions. Never had this before, but he's had emphysema and asthma for years. He's been getting oxygen during transport. Okay. All right. So, uh, you know, as we go, if you guys have any thoughts or ways you want to refine your differential diagnosis for what might be going on, um, feel free to chime in. Um, and so uh, I'm going to actually go back real quick and ask you guys, what, what components of the physical exam do you want to order before I give you those data points? Great, yeah, perfect. Chest, pulmonary, lung, heart, exactly. So remember the big four, you know, you're always gonna wanna do um, a cardiovascular exam. Um, you're always going to wanna do, uh, you're always gonna to wanna to have a, a general idea of the general appearance of the patient. You're always gonna to wanna to do a lung exam, um, an abdominal exam. Like these are pretty bread and butter routine kind of things that, that you're always gonna do. A, generally a head and neck exam is always warranted. In other scenarios where it might be less helpful or, or maybe hold you back a little bit in terms of time, they're probably not gonna penalize you in terms of points or some of the other components of the exam. But you know, you can, if you're ever unsure and you think there might be helpful data points, it's, it's better to be broad than to, to miss something, both because they want you to do a thorough physical exam. And number two, because it may help you figure out what the diagnosis is if you're not sure. And so I'm going to, there's a lot of um, text here and it can be hard to navigate this, especially when you're under the pressure of the timing on the exam. Um, and, and just to state, when, whenever you're confronted with this kind of thing, I think it's best just to take a deep breath, kind of get your bearings a little bit. I, I am of the tendency, if I see all of this, I'm going to try to blast through it. And I often find that that holds me back more than anything because the time I'm spending rapidly trying to incorporate all this information into my brain is not working and it's not, you know, it's, it's time ends up being time wasted instead of time saved. Um, so he is, is overweight, as we already know from his um, vitals. He's moaning and holding hands over the right side of his chest. Okay, so that all kind of fits with the, the history that we received so far. He's pale and cool. And, and that's, that's important, you know, you might think that that might just be like, oh, okay, that's kind of a curiosity, but but your, your skin temperature can often be a marker of end organ perfusion. Um, and if your skin is becoming cold, if, if the patient is becoming cold, you start to worry about, you know, they're not perfusing and they're going into shock. And we already know that his blood pressure is 90 over 60. So that's, that's not good. That's a little concerning in this case. Um, there are some uh, components. Uh, so in the head and neck exam, there's some um, pertinent positives, some component pertinent positives. So I'll just read those out for the sake of time that he has slight tracheal deviation to the left, his jugular venous distension. Uh, he has hyper, so in the chest exam, he has hyper resonance to percussion on the right. He has no breast sounds on the, presumably on the right then, um, but he has breast sounds present on the left. And then uh, we already know that he has the jugular venous distension from before and looking through the rest of it, there's not a whole lot that stands out to me other than he's still unable to answer questions Due to respiratory distress. So, so what do you guys think? Is there a diagnosis that's standing out to you? Anything from the data that we now have to help you refine your differential diagnosis even further? I think some people were chiming in before with what they thought. Yeah, perfect. Great. I love it. You guys are so on it. So this is a pneumothorax. And, and when you see that kind of shock-like picture, especially think about a tension pneumothorax, which is what everyone that is a phenomenal job, guys, a tension pneumothorax. And so when you see that jugular venous distension, when you see that hypotension, when you see the cool extremities, 
it's it's pretty concerning in this case. Um, and so uh, and so we'll keep plugging along. Um, this is kind of the order panel that that I would I would dive into up front. Uh, he's already got oxygen, and, and oftentimes this will uh, already be pre-populated because they already started. As mentioned, as Callie mentioned before, you know, oftentimes, you know, in, in real life, you don't necessarily need to order placing a peripheral IV or all of these um, kind of uh, more specific kind of things because it's already kind of been done in real time. Um, but but on this exam, you, you kind of do. Uh, in this case, we have. Um, uh, in this case, we have to put all of that kind of thing in. So the oxygen's already here. And this is one case where they, they're actually already giving that to us. But some other things that I also think about. So he's having chest pain. And so you want to think, you want to still keep a broad differential diagnosis, as, as Callie mentioned before. You want to make sure that you're considering, you're not anchoring just on pneumothorax and, and forgetting about other important diagnoses. So getting an EKG as listed down here, um, a troponin, um, you know, there might be the, the JVD might be related to some heart failure. So maybe getting a BNP. Your routine labs are almost always going to be correct to obtain. So at least a CMP, you know, get your LFTs and your basic metabolic panel and a CBC so that you kind of know what's going on in their blood. And, you know, when I was going through this, I felt pretty confident in the diagnosis of uh, attention pneumothorax. And so I don't know if you guys remember the adage. I felt like it was drilled into my brain when I was on surgery as a, as a medical student, but I mean, do a, a, a needle thoracostomy in the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line. And, and does anyone know why we do that or what you would expect afterwards? Um, I'll give you guys a, a second to chime in. I'm also going to be consulting people that are going to be better at this kind of thing and managing this kind of thing than I am. So, you know, this is a, a pulmonary problem. It's a, a, a thoracic problem. So I want thoracic surgery here. Um, pulmonary medicine to figure out why they're having this pneumothorax. You know, he has um, he has emphysema and he has asthma, which are risk factors for developing one. Um, great. So, so some thoughts uh, chiming in in the chat. So, really, the, the the needle thoracostomy is just to offload that pressure. Remember that attention pneumothorax is like a one way valve. So you're filling up that pleural space with tons and tons and tons of air that every time you breathe in pushes more into the pleural space, but then you can't get it back out. And so this kind of gives an offshoot for all of that air to get out of the pleural space and to help relieve that pressure. And then um, it buys you time for the definitive treatment, which is going to ultimately be this tube thoracostomy or, or a chest tube. Um, and so, um, so to move on from this, um, it, it, at the end, so we, we kind of executed really the entire plan at this point. Uh, we have by ordering that by ordering the needle thoracostomy. I think I, they'll give you a little blurb in the in the subsequent screens that there's a whoosh of air that comes out, which is exactly what we're looking for. Um, and then after you place the chest tube, you want to make sure you get a chest X-ray to make sure it's positioned correctly, and that closes out the case. Um, and so this is a, an example. You know, we, um, we a question that I often get with students is. What, what does it mean that the case ended? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? And generally, it, it means that you've seen this through to completion. So your treatment, your, your plan for the patient is, is done. You've kind of done everything that you need to do and, um, and, and it's finished. And you may not, it doesn't necessarily mean that you got every single possible point that you could. It, 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 I don't, I don't, I might be a little bit of bad news to say that it doesn't mean that everything was done perfectly, but it does mean that you, you treated the patient and you took care of them. And, um, and so it shouldn't be something that causes any consternation. And if anything, you should, you should feel good that you, you got to the end. Um, the converse where the case is still going and the patient is still uncomfortable or in pain, or you're still not sure what they have, obviously that would be less ideal than, than having it end. Um, Again, just to reemphasize, don't forget that counseling at the end. So, uh, you know, the patient was a smoker, then make sure you're taking note of that and then counseling on smoking at the end. And then they do ask you for what you think the diagnosis is. And so you can punch into a text box the, the diagnosis that you think the patient ultimately had. Um, and so just to highlight a couple more key points from this case, read the history and physical exam carefully. This patient, you know, you might think about getting a chest x-ray up front, or you might think about getting a CT scan, or, you know, are there other things that you want to, <clears throat> are you still thinking about a PE, are you still thinking about, and, uh, and the, the point is this patient is unstable, you know, they're, they're hypotensive, they're going into shock, they need treatment now, and they need treatment quickly, and because of that, you know, if you delay that treatment, 
number one, the, the interface is going to start putting pressure on you. Like the patient is still obtunded, you know, the, the patient is still uncomfortable or in pain. And, uh, and number two, it's going to, it's going to adversely affect your score. You know, you, you have to be able to, um, a, a part of the scoring is making sure that you're doing things in a timely manner. And if you're not doing that, if you're not, you know, it, moving forward placement of a chest tube on the right time scale that'll also come come through and how uh, how it's evaluated um so so all of that's to say uh just keep an idea back to the point about sick or not sick and of course this is a perfect example of a patient who's pretty sick um all right so kelly anything else you would add or any other um, tips or tricks you'd use for a case like this or or any other cases no, I think that, um, yeah, you covered that really well. The only other thing that I'll um, add here, just because I thought um, the, the orders um, was a great example of this. I've had numerous people ask me, um, you know, like in a moment of panic, right? Like you might forget the name of like a procedure or a, um, you know, like, test you need to order or something like that. Um, so just for like reference, when you type in, like, for, for example, like say you like didn't know that it was called like, you know, like some people will say like needle decompression, right? If you type in needle, like on um, the interface, it'll give you like all of the orders that contain the word needle. Um, and same thing with like, if you put in like thoracotomy, it would like, you know, like it would give you everything. So um, if you like are in a moment of panic and can't remember the name of, I don't know, like, like cholecystectomy, I know that's an easy one, but like, if you're like, oh, the patient has cholecystitis, what's the name of the surgery? You could start typing cholecystitis um, and it'll come up. So I think that's helpful because a lot of people just like in under pressure, you like forget the names of things. That is so true. Yeah. Definitely leverage that search engine to your advantage. Yes. I remember like typing in random things and like hoping to find what I wanted. So perfect. Um, we'll go into a couple more, um, kind of pointers for the CCS cases. Um, and so I think we've kind of alluded to this already. Um, but, um, as great as the USMLE tries to be um, in terms of making sure they're testing our clinical knowledge, um, this these cases are about how they want you to manage the conditions, not how you might do it in real life or at your hospital um, and your institution. And so um, big things that I think are important for that are um, in general, and again, like there's definitely times when this is probably wrong, um, but in general, for the sake of this exam, like you're probably never going to get points off for getting like a basic CBC, um, BMP or CBC, CMP, depending on the situation. Um, whereas like in real life, like you might not always need that. Um, kind of some other examples of this are like um, pre-op antibiotics or um, antibiotics that you use for like just like common um, conditions. Of course, we all have our own like beautiful antibiograms at our own hospital and like, you know, our own go-to antibiotics. But for the sake of this exam, like when you're going through the practice cases, I think UWorld um, and, you know, between UWorld and the ccscases.com, um, you will get a wide variety of those types of cases where you will learn like, okay, like it's fine for me to just order ceftriaxone. That's probably in real life, not what you should do, but it's probably fine for the purpose of this exam. Um, so things like that are um, just important to keep in mind. And so you do have to play the game a little bit, so to speak. Um, but for the most part, it is pretty clinically accurate, I would say. Um, and then like we have already talked about, um, practicing, like practice, practice, practice. Um, if you have time to do every single exam or every single practice um, case, I highly recommend it. Um, just because the more you take the time to like practice entering these orders and like get your flow down of how you like to do it, um, the more prepared you will be on, um, exam day. I will say like, I personally was so stressed about these cases. Like I was panicking and on exam day, it felt like a breeze. And it's cause I had done just so many that like, there was no way I could be unprepared. Um, so really just do every single one. And that, that should be something at like the top of your to-do list um, when studying for this exam. Um, and like we said um, earlier, there's usually um, one to two cases. If I remember, I think there's 12 cases total usually. Um, and there's usually one to two that are like slightly harder than the others. A lot of them will be like um, the first case where we had, where it's like right off the bat, you're like, okay, this is probably appendicitis. Maybe it could be ovarian torsion or something else, but it's probably appendicitis. 
Um, so you'll have many cases that are like that, that are pretty straightforward and easy. And those are the ones that you should really like take the time to like, make sure you get every single teeny tiny little point. Um, because if you're not having to think a ton about the diagnosis, you have time to think about all of the other like counseling aspects and things like that. Um, and the better you do on those, the more margin of error you have to like not do as well on some of the others. And so I've definitely heard from um, a lot of people I've tutored, a lot of my friends who have taken this exam that um, I feel like on average, it's pretty standard for there to be at least one case where you like at the end were like, mm, I'm not entirely sure if I know what the final diagnosis was. Um, and so just, you know, make sure you rack up all the points you can on the super easy ones so that if you have one that you just are completely like lost on, um, it's not going to be the end of the world. Um, and the other thing I will say about that too, is they usually make it pretty obvious, um, if a patient is doing worse. Um, and so like, if you have a case where like every time you reassess the patient and like get the history, if every single time, like their pain score is going up or their vitals are looking worse, you should probably like, that's a time where you should be like, okay, I'm really missing something big. Like, let me redirect what I'm doing versus there will be like even some of the cases where, you know, they're a little bit harder and you might not know exactly what's going on, but if they're not tanking, like if you have them on, you know, IV antibiotics and they're just, you know, staying stable, that's better than them like getting worse. So they will make it very obvious if, if your patient is not doing well. Um, and those are the times where you can, you know, really be like, okay, I need to like reapproach how I'm thinking about this case. Cause I'm missing something pretty big. Um, and you can always go back and do a physical exam again, because the physical exam can change on these patients. So you can go back and do a physical, um, you can, you know, kind of that's, that's a time where like, if you're really, really stuck, you could just kind of do a shotgun approach to like order a bunch of basic labs or some basic imaging, um, to try to give you some direction, but those cases are few and far between. Most of them are pretty darn straightforward. Um, and then, like we already said earlier, um, I think if you can give yourself at least two to three days in between, um, your first day of testing and the second day, that is like the most ideal scenario. Cause it gives you some time to just like recover from the fatigue of day one. And also gives you time to like literally purge all of the biostats out of your mind. And then think about all of these kind of like last minute details for the CCS cases that'll give you those like extra bonus points. Perfect. Awesome. Um, so we'll, we'll keep plugging along and just, um, just to highlight some, some common mistakes to avoid is, uh, is again, just want to emphasize that questions are your best friend in this. And so it's, it has to be front and center in your study plan. Um, it's really the case for everyone that I work with. And you really want to try to aim to do at least one pass through the U world. If you're able, if you have the bandwidth to, you know, go back and maybe do some of your incorrect questions or, or try a second pass, um, that, that would be um, definitely warranted. And, and, you know, if you finish the U-World and you want to broaden to other question banks, I also think that's reasonable. Again, emphasizing that you want to be realistic with the time that you have. But again, questions, questions, questions are huge. Um, again, to keep a realistic study schedule all the same. Um, with the cases, uh, you know, you, you, it is unique. It is something that is different about step three compared to the other exams. But I also just want to emphasize the cases really, you know, it's, there's no, they don't, the NBME and the US Assembly don't really publish how all of this gets graded, what their, what their algorithm is. But the, and so it, it, it's not perfectly clear, but what I can tell you is actual test time, time that you're spending in the testing center, the CCS cases really only amount to about 25% of that total time. The majority of this test is still questions. And so you don't want to feel like you need to put all of your attention towards the cases and let that come at the expense of making sure that you're studying everything that this, that this test could uh, possibly be testing you on. Again, I think it's, it's many people may understandably really want to shirk away from the biostats, don't like the biostats. And, 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 you know, I get it. Like it's, it's, it can be a, unwieldy. It can be a lot to have to, to try to remember and think through and, and you might be removed from some of the mathematics that goes into it, um, but you really have to, to buckle down, make sure you feel comfortable with this stuff before you move in for the, move into the exam, because it is such a huge component of the test. I, I really want to restate again, 
a third, maybe even a half of the first day really is heavily geared towards biostats and ethics. That's the idea behind step three. You know, step one is the basic science. Step two is the clinical knowledge. And step three is the application of all of this into real world practice. And a big part of that is, is confronting ethical dilemmas and being able to understand biostatistical data, you know, a clinical trial result or a study design or, you know, types of error. You have to be able to do that in the practice of medicine. And this is the purpose of the test is to make sure you can. And then, um, and then this last point, again, to the, to the point that Callie brought up before, have a, a clear test state in mind. And, and when you do that, you can't still go in with go into your study period with the idea, well, I have a date, but I might move it. You know, if you're going to move your exam back, it has to be for a clear reason. Practice tests aren't where you want them to be. Uh, you feel like you're not through enough of the material that you want to be. But and, and to that second point, you have to have a plan of like, well, this is what I still want to be able to accomplish. And here's how I'm going to structure the additional time that I'm giving myself to be able to get through that. You know, so if you want, if you want to expand your goal to be able to do more questions, well, then be realistic and say, like, okay, well, I'm, I'm I still have 800 questions that I still want to do my exams in a week. So maybe I'll push my exam back another week or two weeks so that I can divide up those questions into a more manageable amount each day. But, but having that actual conversation with yourself or, or with whomever uh, is, is crucial. You can't just keep saying, well, I just don't feel like dealing with it right now, so I'm just gonna move it. Uh, you have to have, you have to have a, a rationale behind it or else you're just going to keep moving it down and down further and further into the future. And so, um, and so just to give you guys, a, a, again, to circle back to our, our point at the beginning about MST and who we are, um, you know, again, it's it, what we focus on is really the one-to-one -one tutoring, and um, and what that looks like is is you work with with someone like like Callie or me, and um, we develop a, a custom study schedule. And I think that this is really where the the majority of the benefit comes from is just having someone who kind of tells you which resources to use, how to navigate doing that, and then holds you accountable to make sure you're keeping up with that. Um, the tutoring sessions are adaptive, and so I, I always, you know, kind of leave the flexibility with my the students that I'm working with about what they want to review and how they want to go about reviewing it. Some people like to do questions, some people like to do content, and, and oftentimes we end up doing a little bit of a mix of both. Um, having someone who you can communicate with in between sessions, um, and so, you know, if you ever have a question or something comes up, um, and, and then again, just someone who can support you through the process and help you navigate all of this. Um, beyond that, we um, we also do uh, planning sessions that kind of just give you like a, a a quick kind of general overview of, of an entire study plan and how to approach all of these things and go into a little bit more about what resource preparation, what resource selection looks like and preparation for these exams. Um, and then um, and then as I mentioned up front, you know we we've also especially uh, those on the step three side have gone through the residency application process and have an idea of how to navigate ERAS residency interviews, generating your rank list. Um, and are also happy to help with that. And so with that, we'll move into the last phase of our talk tonight and, and my personal favorite, the, the Q&A. And so if you guys have any, you guys have asked great questions over the course of the evening. Um, and I, I, think, um, I think we've tried to do a pretty good job of answering those in real time as best we're able to, but if there's anything we missed uh, or that people have um, further questions about or, or things that we didn't address, um, feel free to chime in at any point. And I'll just go back through. I think there was one question on here about the practice test. And if I can just broadcast that out to everyone, because I think that's a good one. Um, what are the practice tests? How do you go about using them? There aren't a ton of them, unfortunately, for step three. Uh, you know, I think uh, in a perfect world, we'd have more metrics for evaluating where people are. Um, the, the main ones that I recommend, and really the main ones out there, are the two U-World self-assessments. Um, and then there's an NBME that you can also use. The NBME is a little frustrating because it doesn't perfectly convert your score, uh, but um, but you can. There are a lot of calculators online that can give you an idea. They give you a, a general percentage of how you compare to a median, and um, and and then you can extrapolate from there. And it may sound like I'm speaking gibberish right now, but but basically you can you can use you can convert the NBME into a three digit score as well. Um, but there, there really isn't too much more. So just take that caveat and kind of structure things out so that um, uh, so that that you kind of can space your practice test to get through them in the time period that you have, but that you don't use them all at the front or at the end and kind of have a, a plan in mind. Um, 
I'll also throw in the the plug for the free like USMLE. I think it's like 120 or 170 questions. I can't remember how many it is, um, but it's on USMLE's website. They have one for step one, two, and three. Um, so that's another, again, it doesn't give you like a score at the end, but again, if you can like roughly say, oh, I got 60% of the questions right and kind of compare that to what a score of 60% would be on a UWorld or an MBME practice exam. Um, that's just, and it's another set of questions to lay eyes on that's um, completely free. So that's a great one. There's one other great question here, Kelly. Maybe I might put you on the spot just a little bit yeah. about how you prepare for the biostats or recommendations that you tell students for preparation. Yeah, I think um, it's hard. I will say it's hard. So um, UWorld does have a little component that you can add on to your package that's called like biostats um, subject review. Um, and some people have mixed feelings on it. Some people love it. Some people hate it. Um, I personally recommend it. It's like, it's not that much more, you know, if you're already like paying for UWorld, it's only a little bit extra to add on. Um, and it does give you like a nice framework of how to approach biostats and kind of break it down into subjects. So, um, of course, you know, doing all of the practice questions that they have just on the normal UWorld QBank for biostats is crucial. Um, but if you, if you're somebody who struggles with biostats or like really doesn't remember it, like when you're dusting off the cobwebs from, um, step one, um, I think it's really helpful to add that. So what it is just so that, you know, if you, if you want to purchase it is it contains, um, it's like listed by subjects. So it'll be like confidence intervals, um, you know, P values, like it literally has it broken down into topics. Um, and then you, at the beginning of each section, there'll be like three or four very, very short practice questions. So not like a vignette, it'll just be more of like a conceptual type question or like a math problem, essentially, um, applying the biostats concepts. Um, and so you can do those practice questions at the end or at the beginning of each module. And then it literally just gives you almost like a like a paragraph form, little um, like info sheet about that topic. Um, and that can be really daunting to like look at, but if you're somebody who um, does well with like taking notes and like making your own little study guide from that, I think that is super, super helpful. I've recommend, that's what I did. That's what I've recommended to a lot of my students. Um, and I think a lot of people find that to be more helpful than just doing the questions alone. Now, if you're a rock star, unlike me and remember biostats, by all means, you can just get away with the QBank questions on your world. Um, but I personally enjoy that little module you know, it's not perfect. It's not, um, it's not comprehensive by any means. You still need to do the QBank questions, but it's definitely supplementary and gives you at least a framework of how to start studying. Awesome. All right. Well, I think, um, I think with that, uh, we can probably wrap up if anyone else has any remaining questions. Um, and so, um, and so if, uh, with, without it, thanks so much everyone for joining us tonight. It was wonderful to, to spend the, the evening with y'all. And then um, what we'll, if you have any further questions or anything else, feel free to, to reach out to us. Uh, the email address is below, um, hq at medschooltutors.com, a phone number here and, and our, our website. Um, a friendly reminder that if you guys have the 20 seconds to do the quick survey at the end, that would be amazing. I, I think the link is, is in the chat if you're able to. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, I hope you all have a great evening um, and thanks again for joining us.